Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And good afternoon, Roslyn. Uh, we have three audiences today. Um, we have an audience in Roslyn, and we want the people in Roslyn to know that if you stand up and leave, we can see it. Um, <laughs> And we have an audience here on the Schultz campus, and we want you to know that if you stand up and leave, they can see it. <laughs> and we also will have an audience on YouTube. All of our videos are available on YouTube. If you just search for um, TBLT, or Task-Based Language Training FSI, you can find a video of nearly each and every one of our videos, of our lectures. Please help us get the numbers up. Go and look at them. They're fun. They are. Um, all subtitled, and so they're all viewable. This is lecture seven, and the final lecture in our TBLT speaker series, Task-Based Language Training. Uh, I'm going to introduce a person in just a second who needs absolutely no introduction, because you all know her. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank a few people. This lecture series was made possible by ADST, which stands for? <laughs> that was the Association for Diplomatic Studies and Training. And we are very, very thankful to them. They made possible the first lecture in this series, which was Bill Van Patten some four years ago. Paul Nation was here. And this time we had seven lectures uh, in the series. Coming up soon to a theater near you, because we have to play coming attractions, we will have a three lecture series in 2020 focused on heritage language heritage language speakers, and I'm sure with quite a bit of discussion on bilinguals and bilingualism, you're all going to find it to be absolutely riveting and fascinating. I'd like to thank a couple of people besides ADST. I'd like to thank Karen Molokoch. <laughs> the only reason she's not doing the introductions was I needed to be able to thank her for all of her hard work. Um, we would like to thank the guys from AV. Um, they have done the impossible. We have been running this series at two times in two venues, and we have made it possible for you to ask questions and for the people on the other campus to ask questions and to give each question an equal voice. We thank our Technology and Innovation Unit in CSD for setting that up. Today's speaker is Kathy Dowdy. Kathy Dowdy is Division Director for one of our five divisions. She comes to us from Castle, and before that, Kathy Dowdy worked in a number of universities, did her graduate work at the University of Pennsylvania, is a world wide recognized scholar in second language acquisition. Um, having Kathy join us here in 2016 was a great coup for FSI. So, but to tell you how this is going to work, I'm going to hand the mic over to Karen and enjoy the talk. Thank you very much. So you all may have heard this before, but I'll say it again. Um, we have microphones. You have your cell phones. Using the cameras on your phones, you can point at this QR code, and then that allows you to submit questions at any point during the presentation. I will be fielding your questions and asking them on your behalf from both cam campuses. Um, and at this time, I will actually be uh, asking these more or less throughout the presentation. So if there's something that you need clarification about, you can go ahead and send that question in, and I will, uh, I will not wait until the very end to ask it. Uh, thank you. And now I'll hand it over to Kathy. OK, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes? OK, wonderful. I also want to thank Karen. She's been tremendous um, through the whole series and also today in helping me get organized. And she does a great job with the questions, as I'm sure you know. I want to thank you all for coming. 
Uh, and I want to thank Jim and others for the opportunity to do the wrap-up session for this really interesting topic. It's really great. Um, <clears throat> so we've come together today to discuss these various um, points um, that I sent out to you and to see where we're going next. So that's really our, our main point, our main purpose today is to keep the momentum going. A lot of you have said that to me. I want to keep the momentum going. What can we do? What should we do? So I have some ideas which I'll share with you today. And also I hope you have ideas that you'll share either today or in the future. <coughs> so I mentioned, um, first of all, we have this little warning that TBLT has become a bandwagon. So what's a bandwagon? A bandwagon is something that people believe in because everyone else believes in it and they don't take time to think about the evidence or the background. Um, and this has happened time and time again in our field of language teaching. So we've had the bandwagon of the direct method. The direct method said everyone should learn the way a second language the way they did as a child. That was kind of reacting against grammar translation where you read a sentence in one language and translated it into another. We had another bandwagon, which was called communicative language teaching. Everyone's nodding on that one. That's a huge one. It was important because it was reacting against audiolingualism, grammar translation, and methods like that, which brought us the famous verb paradigms, slot and fillers, fill in the blank kind of approach to language teaching. Communicative language teaching reminded us that language is all about communication. That's its fundamental purpose. However, there was this kind of taboo on any attention to grammar, which wasn't helpful. I mean, it was helpful to get away from only focusing on grammar, but uh, one of the results, and this was shown by research, is that students were not particularly accurate. They were very communicative, but they weren't necessarily that accurate. So accuracy is important. Um, and we'll see that uh, TBLT takes that into account. So bandwagon is one way to think of it. Pendulum swings is another. Grammar, communication, now we're in the middle. How about accurate communication? TBLT will talk a little bit about that. So publishers love to perpetuate bandwagons because they sell books. So you'll see the same book. It hasn't changed for you know 25 years and it was um, a grammar-driven syllabus. It was a communicative syllabus, and now it's a task-based syllabus. It's the same book, okay? <laughs> so um, they go for the one-size-fits-all. Sometimes they'll put layers, like here's the grammar layer, here's the communicative function layer, and here's the task layer. That's all they do. They don't change the book. Um, another thing that I've heard a lot is oh, from instructors everywhere, not just here, oh, I already do TBLT. And the reason for that is that it's really true. You, you and we do some elements of TBLT, and there are two kinds. One is there are some elements in TBLT that exist in all kinds of good language training, and good language teachers do them. And then also some people have started to pick up on the things that are unique to TBLT. So that's maybe my first caveat, is that TBLT is not the only way to teach language, and <coughs> I'm not here to say it is. But I am here to say what it is, okay? So uh, I'm going to be talking about the real TBLT and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but that is because I just want all of us to understand it. Okay, so what is the real TBLT? Just a couple of um, bits of terminology. The first thing is task. And this is where the bandwagon thing really comes into play. Because now a task is anything and everything, including a fill-in-the-blank exercise. This is the original definition of task. Tasks are the real world activities people think of when planning, conducting, or recalling their day. So if you're asking yourself, is what I'm doing in the classroom a task in the TBLT framework? If it says something like, practice the past tense in a story about yesterday, that's not a task in TBLT, okay? It's an activity, so we could just be more precise about our terminology. There are lots of activities. Um, today we're talking about tasks with this definition. 
Okay. Um, and then this is another one. Um, what is task-based? Task-based means that we're using that task in the first line as the unit of analysis for course design. So everything we do is going to be based on the task. What are we going to do today? It's a task. It's not a grammar feature. Okay. Um, and so that's why um, there are lots of things that are out in the bandwagon and in the literature that are task supported. They're leaning towards some of the principles of task-based language teaching, but they typically will start with a language focus. And so that automatically makes it task supported and not task based. Okay, and then the last thing I hope to mention a few times today is that, and this is just in general, language teaching should be evidence based and meet a set of criteria. I think we all agree on that. I think we really work on that here at FSI, whatever our approach to language teaching is. We're looking for evidence that what we do is working and is um, well justified based on scientific principles, <coughs> a TBLT really tries hard to meet these criteria. Now, I think you remember when Mike Long was here, he said TBLT hasn't figured everything out yet. There are a couple of things that are still hard, and I'll point those out today. Okay, um, oh, I should also mention that I pulled a few slides from that first lecture that Mike gave us um, with permission, so if they look familiar, they are. And here's one, but I'm going to unpack it a little bit for you. So as I mentioned, as I just mentioned, um, TBLT is evidence-based and it's based on SLA findings, second language acquisition findings. So here's one that's sometimes hard for people to understand. This is a little bit of jargon from um, the, the uh, applied linguistics field. TBLT employs an analytic syllabus with a focus on form. Let's turn that into our language. We, we work in the four strands. By the way, I didn't get the question, can we do TBLT because we do the four strands? And the answer to that is yes. And I think you'll see that a lot of the principles in the four strands are also principles of TBLT. So here's one of them. Um, TBLT employs meaningful input with reactive language focus. So that's the one difference. In the four strands, it doesn't really stress being reactive in language focus. Reactive just means wait until the learner needs it when the problem arises. Okay. The second one I think is pretty self-explanatory. TBLT encourages incidental as well as intentional learning, develops both implicit and explicit knowledge. So you get that, right? Yeah? Okay. Third one again, a little bit of jargon. TBLT has psycholinguistic credibility. What does that mean? TBLT engages brain processes that support language learning. So if you were here when Michael Ullman was here, a fascinating talk, and he was talk showing us the pictures of the brain and the structures of the brain and the parts of the brain that underlie declarative learning, declarative memory, and the parts of the brain that underlie procedural memory. Remember that? And we were you know, guessing which is which, and we were seeing the the effects of getting older on your memory systems and all of that. This, he was talking about the brain structures. Psychologists talk about the brain processes that go on in those brain structures. So they've done the studies to show the brain, the um, cognitive processes that go on that support language learning. So it's really cool that all this evidence is coming together. That's what excited me about Michael Allman's talk was that these, you know, processes that we've known about from you know, online reaction time studies and things actually have physiological structure in the brain. Okay, um, <clears throat> so this is more from SLA, but um, honing in on being learner-centered. So that was another bandwagon, by the way. Do you remember those days when everything had to be learner-centered? There was even something called the learner-negotiated syllabus where you came in and you said, what do you want to learn today to a brand new learner? That was a disaster, terrible bandwagon. <laughs> but any good teacher knows you start where the learner is, okay? But what does that mean specifically to be learner-centered in TBLT? Well, first of all, the course content is determined by the learner needs, not by an externally imposed grammar syllabus. By the way, these are gonna be things that we have to change our mindset about 
And I'm going to mention that again. So try to remember these three things. So learner needs drives the course. Language focus is reactive and responsive to the learner's internal syllabus. So I already talked about what responsive means, when it comes up, when it's needed. The learner syllabus, there's a whole body of research that shows that your second language develops systematically just like your first language did. Not in exactly the same way, but it is systematic. And sometimes you will be at a stage in learning where um, it's not appropriate, you're, you're not ready for something, it's going to be further down the track. Good teachers know this intuitively, so I think you know what I'm talking about. You, you hear a problem from one of your students, you don't address it because you know they're not ready. Um, so that's what this means. Um, okay, and then um, processability constrains learnability, which constrains teachability. I thought that was a little bit of jargon. So students learn what they can process. Teaching should keep this in mind. Okay, but the, those fancy words just are the words that the researchers use, and so I left them up there just to make the point that there is a lot of research to show this. So you can waste time in two ways, learning something that a student's not ready for, and then, well, actually just different ways of not being ready for it. It just wastes time. Um, so this is all to say that the real TBLT is not a bandwagon. Um, it's a real approach to language teaching, and it has a, its own organization. So if you want to go to that website, uh, you can see who's in it, our speakers. I think Marta gonzalez Yora is the treasurer, and Con Van Gorp is something, vice president. <laughs> He's not the president. I didn't recognize the name of the president. And then there are people who have done various things, and also there's a, bi a biannual conference. All right, so next question, why should we try TBLT at FSI? These are some of the things that I think are good reasons for it. We have regular inputs of students with similar needs. Actually, maybe I should back up and say, why am I asking this question? You know, we could just try anything. But not really, because TBLT is very difficult to do if you do it right and if you follow all the principles. It's really hard. I hope to show you that it's worth it. Um, but we need to see if, you know, if we can do it here. So having regular inputs of students with similar needs, you may think that their needs are different, but compared to other places where students have a wide range of needs, it's very focused here. Um, there's an annual demand for job relevant training. How many of you read in your ALICE survey responses? We need more job training. I needed to be able to do this, and I couldn't when I got to work. Uh, so there's a demand for it. Um, we have a robust curriculum development protocol. We have a whole unit that supports us. We can apply for um, backfill teachers to free up other teachers to work on curriculum. That is very special. We are really lucky to have that. We have a large core of talented teachers who are, many of you are here, and you have support from training specialists and learning consultants. So again, that is really <coughs> something that we can draw on. Um, we have small classes. Now, <coughs> TBLT would say group people according to their jobs. And that's been done before here. Uh, so we could rethink it. We, we typically group by proficiency, which is not a bad thing. Um, and then um, we have access to domain experts. We tend to call them subject matter experts. These are the people who do the job or know the job really well. <coughs> and then we have experiential learning spaces, which is great. I think other places have this too, but you know, we do. We have the Innovation Lab, we have the Visa Windows and things. So those are just some reasons why I think we should try TBLT here. Okay, oh, see the question. So thank you for sending in questions ahead of time. And so I've tried to weave them into the talk, but still keep them coming if you have other questions. So there are actually a, a few. Okay, go um, for it. <laughs> so uh, who determines learner needs? Okay, that's coming up. Okay. So I'm going to save the answer to that question because okay. we're going to go through that in a lot of detail. And then I think you spoke a little bit 
uh, on this topic, but if you wanted to add to this, given that there is a question about um, you know, task-based, student-based, student-centered, content-based, what is the difference and how do we draw the lines? Okay. It sounded like you incorporated, or the student-centered is incorporated into task-based, but if you wanted to speak more to that. Okay. Right, okay, and I didn't talk about, uh, content-based is another um, you know, pretty robust approach to language teaching. I wouldn't really call it a bandwagon because it did have a very defined purpose where, um, you know, the focus was on learning the content and the attention to form or grammar was secondary. Um, <coughs> so it seems that content learning could be task-based learning um, depending on the content. If the content is the language itself, <laughs> then it's not task-based. And then what is the role of pre-task activities in planning TBLT? Okay, that's a good question. Um, later on I'm going to say we should try TBLT without, or maybe shortly, without, yeah, I'm saying it now, without breaking any rules. Um, so some of the things in TBLT are really strict. Um, and so my second point here is I think that we, if we want to make an exception, we could try. So pre-task planning what might be something like that. I could give an example, which is I've always thought, wouldn't it be nice if students have the frequent vocabulary that they need before they go into the task-based um, materials? So the answer t from the pure purists, the TBLT purists, is no, no way. Um, it's not necessary. Not that it's a bad thing, but it would be a waste of time. Not necessary. Uh, so we, it would be a, um, a really interesting project to try to do it and say, is it more efficient to get exposed somehow to frequent vocabulary? We're already doing that, so we believe that exposure to frequent vocabulary is important and in a certain rep, you know, repetition pattern, and there is some evidence for that, so we ought to try it. Let's see if we can um, improve the outcome of a task-based activity with some kind of pre-activity planning. But usually that's a no-no. Um, so the only thing that I'm going to say right now is I don't think we should break any second language acquisition rules. I don't think anybody should do that in any form of language teaching because you know, if, we, if we have evidence that something works in a certain way, let's just use that information. Um, but as I mentioned before, TBLT hasn't figured everything out yet, so we may need to figure some things out too here, and that would be fun. Um, so the questions that I got, questions one and two, are can one improvise TBLT? So the answer to that, is, as I hope you'll see over the next few minutes, is definitely not. It's, it has to be carefully planned and um, following a certain set of pr uh, methodological principles and pedagogic procedures. And question two, is TBLT a full course curriculum or just an hour of classwork doing dialogues and working on activities that lead the student to be more natural. <clears throat> so, um, I don't think, TBLT envisions itself as a whole course, a whole curriculum. Uh, I don't see why we couldn't do TBLT modules. So that's what I'm gonna talk about later. Um, but definitely not just an hour, <laughs> a one hour activity. And um, <clears throat> dialogues, that's out. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit later. <clears throat> okay, so what does it mean to follow all the steps of TBLT? Let me, I'm going to show all of them to you, and then I'm going to go through them as far as I can get with a specific example. Um, and that was question three. Realistically, what are the steps needed to design a TBLT set of materials? And then we just got the question, how do you identify the needs? And that's the first thing. So needs analysis is important for any kind of teaching. You all know that. Um, Task-based needs analysis does it in a special way to get the information needed for task-based language teaching, materials development, and pedagogy. So the first thing that we have to do is identify the target tasks. Remember, the task is the everyday things people do throughout their day at work. Or, you know, so we could think of it in embassies, around the embassy, that kind of thing. And we've done that um, here at FSI. We got a really good start um, through the efforts of LTU and EMU. Um, 
So I'm going to show you how you can access that information, hopefully, at, at the end if we have time. And this is a resource we have. It's a fantastic resource, and we're hoping to continue it. <coughs> uh, the way we did that was to uh, interview some foreign service officers from different career tracks. And then from the interviews, detailed interviews, we created questions, targeted questions. Then we sent out, this is a very simplistic version, but we sent the questions out to as widely as we possibly could. We fortunately got a pretty representative sample back. And then we analyzed um, the data. Some of the people who did that are sitting in this room. Um, just to say, OK, what is a task? So the one pitfall that can happen is that we tend to think, so remember we're going to have to shift our mindset. <coughs> we tend to think of skills, reading, listening, speaking, writing. So when we ask people questions sometimes, we say, um, what, do you use the tar what do you use the language for at post? We don't want to ask that question. We want to say, what do you do in your job? And we just see what are their tasks. Some tasks won't involve language at all. But we want to know what their tasks are. Um, <clears throat> OK, second, I'm not, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Let me just go through the, uh, all, all of the steps, and then I'll go into detail. We need to collect and analyze target discourse samples. And the reason for that is because there have been lots of studies to show that when we make up in dialogues and in other ways what we think people say when they're doing tasks, we're usually wrong. Um, so if you're interested, I can point you to that research. What word do you never say in Starbucks? Coffee. You never say that word. But it's always in the textbooks, right? So this kind of thing, lots of graduate students do studies like that. You never say ticket when you're at a train station. Things like that. Um, okay, so secondly, course design. We have to take the, t so we have to go up and down. So now you're going to see how, why it's so hard. It already sounds hard, but it gets harder. We have to, in order to make it easier, we can, we're not going to teach in our classes to thousands of daily tasks that people do. That would be impossible. So we're going to try to abstract them up to target task types, group them together. I'm going to give you an example later. And then all the people who do any of the tasks under those target task types will benefit from the instruction. So we did that in the needs analysis also. Then going down from that, we have to develop pedagogic tasks. So what this really means is, let's say you identify that somebody needs to, um, let's see, what's a good example? Think of something that your students have to do. Can somebody shout out a task? OK, so visa interview, can we get something a little more within the visa interview? No, the, the work, if the work is stable. If find out, find out. So we try to, try to avoid things like ask questions. That sounds more languagey. Find out what work they do, OK? Um, so if you're, on, in, if you're on day one of um, Portuguese, you're not going to know how to do that, right? So you, the idea of a pedagogic task is to build up to, based on the target discourse samples, how do people find out what the uh, visa applicant's job is? Um, then we have to build up pedagogic tasks to get them to be able to do that kind of discourse. So we are aiming for target language. We're not ignoring language. Um, but they won't be able to do that on day one. So we have to build up a series of tasks. And they have to start um, in the materials development phase. We need to create modules and organize those pedagogic tasks according to complexity. So this is a key thing in TBLT, that the complexity is based on the task, not on the language. OK. Um, yeah, so the question three was, what are the steps needed? So these are the first three. And here's the, uh, these are stages, actually. The next three. In the pedagogy, so we're going to follow methodological principles. Those are the rules of second language acquisition and some rules of um, education and philosophy. And then, this is the part where all of you come in big time. Choose the pedagogic procedures. And this has to be done by the instructors. P 
Nepal nation says the same thing. The four strands is not a prescription on how to teach at the pedagogic procedure level. That's what teachers figure out how to do. You know your students, you know your resources, you know your constraints. So this is where the creativity and the knowledge of the teacher really comes in. Then stage five. Now again, I think you're noticing that these stages could be applied to any kind of language teaching, right? Needs analysis, um, materials development, sequencing, pedagogy, assessment. Um, in TBLT, it's simply one question. Can learners perform target tasks to criterion? We'll get into that a little bit more later. <clears throat> and then finally, any program needs to be evaluated, or courses should be evalu evaluated, and TBLT would just be evaluated just like any other program or course. <clears throat> okay, so now let's dive a little deeper. <clears throat> um, oh, before we dive deeper, let me ask, uh, answer this question. Do we do any TBLT at FSI already? So when I came here, um, I think I mentioned to a lot of you, I was thinking, oh my goodness, we're doing the four strands. <laughs> what about TBLT? What have I done? Um, and I looked at the four strands, and the four strands are based on good SLA principles. There's nothing in TBLT, there's nothing in four strands that goes against TBLT. TBLT is a little more restrictive in things, as I mentioned. When should you do language focus? Paul Nation says 25% of the time. TBLT says reactively, not proactively. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's see, question four. Yeah, similar, has TBLT really been done at FSI? What worked and what didn't? So I took a look at things, and I got a really wonderful email from Christina Hoffman. I think I saw you come in into this room. Thank you. It was so interesting to read. Um, <coughs> so you, um, many of you went to the um, lecture in the series um, by Gary, who talked about bridges. And Christina also talked about the bridges. Um, they were things like dealing with requests, coping with hostility, getting the facts, debating policy. So it sounds like, you know, things that are very task-based like. Um, and Christina mentioned that Bridges made a world of difference in the way that FSI prepared its students for jobs and life overseas, but there was a drawback. Once the materials were developed, they became prescribed, static, and outdated. So that's something I'm pretty sure we will, ha will have to face in TBLT as well. We'll have to keep everything up to date. Um, she also talked about career or cone-related modules. And for this case, um, I've just put a few examples of languages. So I didn't mean to leave anyone else out. Anyone out? I just mentioned you know ones that came to my attention. Um, so this was a case where. Um, I believe it was Christina worked with the Russian faculty on updating job-related materials. Uh, <coughs> they ask experienced students to help with up-to-date content. So this is something that we're going to want to do. Um, and they had the happiest graduating group ever. They thought they were all set for the next group. That group came in and said, I could use some of the vocabulary in these modules, but I wouldn't be caught dead handling these situations the way you wrote them. Okay, so warning, warning, warning about the um, discourse. It needs to be what the people would actually say. We're gonna be, have to be held to that standard too. Um, professional seminars. Um, this I th seems to have begun with French um, and, the, uh, and they still exist and people are getting um, reconnected with them and uh, we'll look at one today that actually is very much t like TBLT. Uh, and basically the idea is to ask students to contact their counterparts at post and start finding out what their job is going to be. What, what do you do on a daily basis? What situations do you need to handle in the local language? Those are sounding like task-based needs analysis questions. Um, so, uh, and then Christina mentioned that in large languages, students could be temporarily grouped into separate job-related training seminars, and I think that's still happening. So I think that's really promising. So those things are very much in line with TBLT. 
Um, I also, before I knew about anything here, I knew about the alert courses because I went to some things that Jim and colleagues, um, I think the session I went to was about French. It was here in a plenary one time. And I also have observed some of the Arabic alert courses. They started out intentionally being TBLT and um, they had the advantage of looking at the diplomatic security manual which describes the jobs. So they had a really good source. You don't have to always ask people what do you do in the job. You can go to written sources as well. So that's something that we do here. Um, and lately I've been looking at the innovation lab simulations. I've been doing, the deep dive I'm going to do today is in Spanish because I can understand that language. And also Emilio is very cooperative <laughs> in answering all my questions. Um, but I know they're in other languages, especially what's going on in iLab. So if you hear me talking about something in Spanish or Portuguese, just think, oh, that's ha I know that's happening in your language. If I mention something, think about what you're doing in your language, because I know these things are happening. And then the French FAST course, I have to admit, I haven't observed it yet, but that's next on my list, um, that took a task-based orientation, and I've heard really favorable reviews of it. So. Um, yes, we are doing things that look TBLT-like to me. Um, now I'm going to go through right now and unpack, I have the word caveat up there, I'm going to unpack the Diplomatic Security Professional Seminar, which did not start out to be TBLT. And I've already talked with um, Emilio about this a lot, so I'm not criticizing it and saying, well, it didn't do this step in TBLT or that step in TBLT. That may be true, but that wasn't supposed to be TBLT, so keep that in mind. Having said that, much of what's in there is the beginning, the serious beginning of TBLT, which is very exciting. <coughs> um, we also have this great starting point that I want to mention again, which is the 2016 SLS task-based. It was a task-based needs analysis, so um, we should look at that. Okay, so now we'll go a bit more into our the deeper dive. TBLT key concept, um, which we've seen already, the learner-centeredness idea, the most important one, relevant to learners' needs. This is why at first students may react, especially those who've been more traditional language learners, they might react to TBLT, but once they figure out that's totally relevant to their needs, they change really quickly. Um, TBLT tries to react against the textbooks that I told you about, which are one size fits all. Many of us use textbooks here, but then what do we do? We supplement them because they're not sufficient, right? They just cannot do the job. Um, and then another key thing is that our students need functional language abilities um, for their work or um, social purposes. They really need to be able to do things in the language. So, um, you know, it's really important to do a locally conducted needs analysis. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some sources of information, methods of collection, and then go into the, um, as I said, the diplomatic security simulation based professional seminar in Spanish. So this is a slide that I borrowed from Mike Long. So he's very big on methodology. Um, and this is important for us um, because there are some unreliable sources of information and then there are some strongly preferred sources of information. Learners, if they've never done their job before, um, and this is true everywhere, they're not a good source of what do you need to do on the job. Okay, that's very obvious. But guess what? Language teachers are not and materials designers, sometimes they're called applied linguists. All of those people are not good sources of information about what the tasks are. <clears throat> we are the people who do the pedagogy and the methodology, or the other way around, methodology, pedagogy. We are experts in that, not in the jobs. Um, there are, there's published literature, as I mentioned there, and then strongly preferred are the domain experts, the people who do the job. So that would be experienced students who come back for another language or people who are in the job and they can report back to us. And then also um, they're the people who supervise them because they might say, 
what that person told you was not good enough. They actually need to be able to do more. So um, the key thing here is um, triangulate, which means use more than one source. And we are not the domain experts. So I've heard people mentioning being the subject matter expert for a task-based project. None of us are that, unless we happen to have been in the Foreign Service. But we are experts in other things that are coming up in, uh, on other slides. What are the methods? I won't go through all of this, I won't read them all, but you can see, you can talk to people, have them reflect on their intuitions, do interviews, systematically collect information, observe in different ways. Um, and then once we can get all that information, then we have to analyze it. By the way, I'm going to send you the slides so you can have them. <coughs> uh, we have to analyze the needs information that we get and also the target language discourse. So you can see some methods of discourse analysis. Okay, deep dive. Identify target tasks for diplomatic security agents. So this is a few of the things that we did. I told Emilio that I wouldn't get it totally straight. Um, I've been really trying to put it together. That's one thing that I would like to um, say. Let's, when we do this, let's, let's find a repository, put everything in one place, share it, document it, and um, so that we'll have it to work from. Uh, so we've been pulling this all together, and basically it went like this. Um, the idea came uh, from a um, sort of an immersive learning seminar that Emilio and others got interested. Let's do immersive learning. That immersive learning is good for language learning. So it wasn't TBLT per se, but TBLT is a kind of immersive learning. <clears throat> so many of the steps that were taken were very um, consonant with TBLT. So survey dis diplomatic security agents to find out what they do. When I looked at the questions, they were a little bit asking what language skills you need. So we could shift over to what job skills do you need? Still, they got job skills, which is good. Um, hosted a panel of DS agents asking questions in, you know, in person. Um, a really extensive interview with an agent from the um, WHA International Programs Directorate, and he described his own field experience. Um, then it's really important to find out, once you get all this information, what's most frequent? Because where are we going to start? We have hundreds of tasks. If you go to the SLS needs analysis, we have hundreds if not thousands of tasks. Where do we start? Well, with the things that are most important that everyone has to do frequently. <coughs> um, and then after selecting the tasks, they went back and said, okay, these are the things we selected. Do you agree? Yes, we do. Pick one. Let's start with it. So it's iterative. It's back and forth um, and using multiple sources. Um, OK, so question six was, um, could we begin using created dialogues and later, as we gather materials, incorporate key terms and ways of using language to those dialogues? OK, so that's going to be about target language discourse. Um, yeah, so let me save that question. Maybe I should have put that on a different slide. Um, this is what I want. I'm going to s uh, go out of PowerPoint now and go to the site um, where we have um, diplomatic security, scenario-based, simulation-based, and very task-based modules um, for these three main areas, facility security, VIP protection, and investigations with sub-activities. And I'm going to go through the VIP protection one, I hope. How are we doing? Yeah, we're doing pretty well. OK, let's see now. We can go out and into that. Yes, OK. OK, so as you saw, um, there are the different kinds. There's also a section on um, related news articles that have to do with things um, pertaining to these different um, scenarios and simulations. And we're going to go to, well, let's see, a little bit of what's here. Um, the student gets an overview. This is sort of a, uh, this is a professional seminar, as I mentioned, a simulation uh, based professional seminar. It was originally not 14 weeks, now they have about nine weeks to get through all of this. Um, 
and they typically go in order, and some of the things are in sequence. So I've been observing some of these, and that's been very cool. Watch the same students do linked simulations. It gets more and more like real life. So let's look at um, VIP protection, and we'll just start with one. So the um, security motorcade or caravan kind of thing. When I saw that, that title, Language Objectives, I thought, oh no, this is terrible. <laughs> this is not TBLT. But look at the objectives. They're not language ob objectives. They're task-based objectives. So language objectives really means what, will you be able, what tasks will you be able to do in the language by the time you finish these activities. Um, and these are things that came out of the needs analysis. Evaluate and discuss potential risks in the route and the venue with your local POC. Request route analysis and police escort and coordinate the arrival of the VIP to the venue. So these are sort of task types and then each of these can be broken down um, much more. By the way, what's on this site is what the students look at to prepare for the simulation. They know what the scenario is. They know what their objectives are. They do study vocabulary. <laughs> um, so if we go down, there's going to be Quizlets. This is not TBLT. But as I mentioned, this is something that I would like to see if we could you know, add to TBLT with a rationale of voc frequent vocabulary or targeted vocabulary. I'm going to show you, they, the students see everything in Spanish. So they get the scenario, motorcade takes the ambassador to a presentation, obtains information, the ambassador wants to go anyway. So everything they planned in the previous uh, simulation that I just went through has to be changed when they get to this one. This is what they have to do, look at the map, discuss new entry points, and so forth. And then there's the vocabulary. This one, I'm not going to talk about it, but I just want to say one thing today. Um, I, this was a really a wonderful simulation that I observed. The student was extremely experienced at the job, and the teacher was really experienced at the simulation. The teacher was playing the role of the local security officer of the museum, and the student was playing himself. And he just went in. And you know what the, the um, innovation lab looks like. You're surrounded by either 360 film of the inside of the museum or the Google Street Map around the museum. And you're going around actually doing the things that you have to do on the job. And it was really stunning. OK, <clears throat> so now I think I want to go back to the PowerPoint. Let's start up again. <clears throat> No, I'm not there though. Let's start So there are a, a few general okay. questions. Yeah, that, let's take questions. Okay. Um, a couple of these are actually related, so it's nice to see people are thinking along the same lines. So um, teaching using TBLT requires a thorough knowledge of TBLT principles and knowing how we apply them when when teaching based on your students' needs. So does TBLT lend itself to, band, to bandwagon status? And um, a sort of similar question that I'll just attach to that is, how long does it usually take for an educational institution to switch to TBLT curriculum? Uh. Okay. So that's translated to me. TBLT is really hard, <laughs> which is true. Um, so the first question was, do people need training? to do it, yes, and what was the second part of the first question? Or, or rather, you know, because it, there's such a high threshold of, oh, of yeah. things oh, you need to know. Oh, does it lend itself to bandwagon stuff? Exactly. So and in other words, if, you, if, if we don't take the time to really do the training, then we're going to wind up with task-supported language teaching. That happens all the time. Right, and then... There are actually some people who argue in favor of task-supported language teaching. Yeah. And then the other is, is sort of just generally if an entire institution wants to jump onto yeah. that bandwagon. <laughs> well, so I'm not arguing for the bandwagon because um, that's not a good thing to do. But if a whole institution wants to do TBLT, it can be done. I, I went to a place in Barcelona, Spain, 
It was the Ramon Yule Business School, and they decided to do TBLT. They did everything. They did the needs analysis. They were kind of like us. They have similar students, constant throughput of similar students. They found out their needs. They uh, developed a task-based um, course, and they still do it today. So it can be done, but it's not easy. It's not easy. All right, and then uh, in our context, how would you go about determining if TBLT works? And then a, a similar question or, or related to that is, does utilizing task-based learning suggest we also need task-based testing? OK, can we save those questions? Because those sure. both of those topics are coming up. OK, and then another one, okay. uh, what makes a task more complex than others? That's coming up shortly, too. Great. OK, those are great questions. The complexity one is going to come up first, and then the testing one is last. <laughs> this is the one where um, I was getting the question. I got a question, could we begin um, using created dialogues and later incorporate key terms it seems like getting the authentic discourse that covers the task as needed could be cumbersome when one is full-time working on different activities. Um, so the answer from the TBLT people is no, don't create dialogues. Um, but I'm going to put another caveat on that because here's what we do in diplomatic security and I think in consular and other kinds of professionally based modules where we can't record the target discourse. I actually ran this by Mike Long to see if, you know, what kind of a reaction, because he's very much a purist. So I'll tell you what he said in a minute. Um, so the solution here, as I think many of you know, is that, um, but this is a very detailed project, experienced agents provided useful terminology and phrases for their work in English. So what did Mike say to that? Hmm, I'm not so sure it's a good idea for people to introspect about what they say on the job, because maybe they don't really say that at all. Um, so then I pointed out that there's an advantage to that because they go, they have to become diplomatic security agents here in this country first. They know the job and they know what they say in English. So they can write that down. We render it into um, the languages of posts, including different varieties, which is always a challenge. Um, and then, um, we have to go back and check and see if that's what people actually say. So the advantage is we can have one set of target discourse in English. So it's real target discourse in English. Let's go back and see if that's what people really say when they're doing their jobs in English. Render it into the other languages and then check with the people at post, do they actually say those things. Let's try some of that and if it's not too bad, then we can be comfortable with this approach because they don't really see us going recording um, co continuously every single job that um, the Foreign Service officers do. Okay. Oh, that guy was able to make this go away, but I'm not going to be able to. That's okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that's a problem we have. Um, we have a problem getting the target discourse samples. So we've done stage one, steps one and two. We still have five more stages to go. Um, so stages two and three, um, and this is where I want to say we, need, we really need to focus our attention because this is very specific to TBLT, and we're not doing it this way because we didn't start out to do TBLT in the first place. So when we were looking at this, the scenarios, um, that I just showed you in diplomatic security for Spanish, um, we saw the tasks, we saw the tasks broken down. Typically, when I went to the observations, they just start doing the task and um, see how it goes. There isn't any kind of building up to making it more complex in the ones that I observe. Now, I know that I've talked with people who do some of the driving simulations that you might know about. Some of those have been made, that they go from simple to complex, and they're used for beginners. But I, I think we just need to do a lot more thinking about this, and I'm going to show you what the principles are that we should follow. Um, so in terms of task-based development, we need to develop the pedagogic tasks which lead to the target task 
and we have to sequence them according to complexity, and that was the question that we just got. Uh, so I need to give you examples from other things because we, we don't have them here. <coughs> this is really simple, just so we can go through it quickly and you can get the idea, but it's from a real needs analysis, what flight attendants need to do. Um, so they have to serve breakfast, lunch, dinner, drinks, or snacks. At least they used to do that. <laughs> I mean, maybe this study was done a while ago. Um, and then, so the target task type is serve food and beverages. Um, you could see that this could be a way to relate different kinds of service people, flight attendants, waiters, lunch truck operators, that kind of thing. Um, they check life vests, seat belts, oxygen cylinders, so they have to check safety equipment. That's a target task type that you can see generalizing to other jobs. So that's the key thing. When we're doing the target task type, we're trying to cover more than one job. And then checking overhead bins, et cetera, um, prepare for takeoff. So I think you get the idea there. How can you group all these little teeny miniature tasks that you have to do into something that could form a cohesive unit <coughs> and might work across different jobs? Then the idea is to develop pedagogic tasks, sequence them according to complexity of the task and not linguistic complexity. So you'll see in a lot of language teaching materials, let's start with the simplest aspect of language and build to the most complex. <coughs> and linguists and applied linguists have been arguing for decades about how to define that. Isn't the third person singular S really simple in English? then how come so many non-native speakers can never learn it? Well, because it's pronounced in many different ways depending on where it appears in the word and the word next to it. So things can be really difficult. Other things that seem very complicated get learned like that. <coughs> so P TBLT says, let's use task complexity, not linguistic complexity. What does that look like? So this is an area of TBLT where there's a lot of work going on. There's not a definitive answer. There are a lot of possibilities and things that we could try. But the key thing is simplify the task and not the language. I'm not going to go into this today, but if you remember um, the first talk that we heard here, there was an idea about how to elaborate language to make it more comprehensible rather than simplify it. Uh, and another thing is just to um, simplify the task. Build schemas, we have that and we do that all the time. You know and a lot of uh, pedagogies do that. Input before production, that's been known for a long time. Parts before the whole. Now this one is used, this is a, a way to provide feedback on error. So use foreigner talk, that FT means foreigner talk, comes from research. Um, when people talk to non-native speakers, it's also mother ease when parents talk to children, children talk to dogs. Children talk to their dolls. Everybody adjusts what their speech is to make it more comprehensible. So we those things have been identified and shown by research to help with comprehension. And so we can provide feedback on error that way. And then gradually remove all of these kinds of crutches. So let's look at an example of the complexity of the task. Again, this is from the first lecture that we had. Do you remember it, the seating? You might remember the one with the cars driving off the road in the snow, and that takes a long time to explain, so I picked this one because it's easier to explain. But go back and look at the video because that's also very good. <coughs> so let's say you have to seat dinner guests. How do you make the task more complex? And the idea is you start with a simple task and go to the more complex task. So you have the, all these people with various characteristics, and the open task is that they're just going to be meeting for the first time. They're going to be sitting around a round table. They can sit anywhere you want them to. How will you seat them? So this can be solved in a lot of ways. It's not difficult. Um, so an open task can be easy. If you want to make it more difficult, and so this goes to that question, and I think I had another question. It's going to come up on the next slide. Yeah, question seven. Um, you let me read this after I finish this. Uh, it, let's say you, you put some constraints on the task. So there are three rules. 
Now, no two men or women can sit next to each other. Left-wingers can sit next to each other, um, or to centrists, but not to right-wingers, etc. People must be able to speak at least one of the languages of the person on either side of them. Okay, and you can also add more people. So I think in the first one, what did we have? Uh, we have four, six, and eight people, no constraints. Uh, we have, wait, how many do we have? We have six people, no constraints. Here we have six people and three constraints. So I think you can get the idea how you would change it up. Add more people, add more constraints, that kind of thing. So you could build up even more than a two-step um, sequence. So I, the question I got was, was um, I recently went to a staff development session facilitated by a colleague here at FSI. During the session, the tasks were presented in such a way that they would have some element of complication, surprise, or obstacle, as in this example. The learner has to buy certain food items, and the options are restricted due to allergies. The learner goes to the store, can't find them, asks the clerk, the clerk is new, doesn't know where they are, directs the person to the store manager, okay? So the person says, for me, the questioner says, this looks like an unnecessary obstacle that takes the learner away from the task of buying specific items. I'm wondering if we should look at the complexity of tasks for TBLT and gradually increase the complexity of the task. Well, actually, those kind of things do increase the complexity of the task. So I think this example shows it. Some of the same things happen in the diplomatic security um, scenarios that um, <clears throat> one of them uses Drive, one of them is driving the ambassador from the embassy to the museum using simulation software. So I, I think many of you are familiar with this driving simulation software. It can be used for a lot of purposes. This is going from point A to B. And then Matt, who's sitting over there on the computer, is throwing surprises at them, and they have to figure out what to do. And it's, the learners are working either together or with their teacher. So those things, I think, do make the task more complex. It doesn't distract from doing the task. OK, um, so that's an example of dealing with complexity. Um, now, I'm, now I'm getting to the level of what are we doing in the teaching? What is the TBLT pedagogy? Here we're departing completely in terms of step-by-step um, from what we do, but at the level of principles, you'll see some things that are familiar with what we already do in four strands. Okay, so TBLT has 10 methodological principles. The key thing is they're all supported by theory, research, and practice in SLA, language teaching, or philosophy of education. So that's what TBLT really wants to rest on um, research. I highlighted the SLA rules. Remember I said, let's not break any SLA rules. So I highlighted the SLA rules, and the other ones are from education or philosophy, um, and many of them are very famous, like promote learning by doing. Many people have said that. Marie Montessori, John Dewey, um, and guess what? Michael Ullman was saying that too, because the part of your brain <laughs> that you use when you're learning by doing is different from the part of the brain that you use when you're using your declarative memory. Um, so we already talked about using task as a unit of analysis, promote learning by doing, um, elaborate input. This is really complex, so I didn't want to take time today. But the idea is that sometimes materials writers will simplify language from the way that it's normally spoken. And that's exactly the wrong thing to do, because learners need all of that data so that they can use the cognitive processes to learn. So there are procedures for elaborating it, which makes it more comprehensible, but doesn't take away from the data that they need to learn. Provide rich input. We have that, right? Meaningful input. That's one of the four strands. Um, rich input just means meaningful input and varied input. And I think we believe that in the four strands as well. We need varied input. Um, encourage inductive chunk learning. So that is. Um, a principle of several approaches to language teaching, such as content-based learning, um, communicative language teaching, task-based language teaching. Let learners figure things out themselves, picking up chunks, and let their brain processes work on internalizing the structure of the language from that. 
provide reactive language focus. So I already talked about that. This is key because that moment when the learner makes an error, if it's not too far ahead of what, what they can do, is the time when they can benefit from the feedback. They can really, like, a typical thing is they know what they want to say, they know why they want to say it, they know what the impact of what they want to say is, they just need to have the particular language form, vocabulary item, or whatever. So the idea is that they're much more likely to remember it in that psycholinguistic context. And there's research that shows that. So that's the re reactive um, language focus. Provide negative feedback. That's just um, to counter the content, the, the communicative people, especially the ones on the communicative bandwagon who said, never teach grammar, never pay attention to errors, don't focus on, um, don't give any attention for them. TBLT says, yes, you need to provide negative feedback. That just means not negative feedback on, perf you know, like how you're doing, what kind of student you are, but uh, on errors in language. Respect learner syllabi and developmental processes. So I mentioned there's a lot of research that shows that people cannot learn past where they are, or not too far past where they are. And then the other two are um, from general education, promote co cooperative, collaborative learning, works better than competitive learning according to general education research. And individualized instruction, that's a principle of any kind of teaching, not just language teaching. So if we're gonna do the real TBLT, these will be our principles for developing the way that we teach. Um, and then these are the SLA rules that I'm saying we shouldn't break. Getting more deep into the pedagogy, the pedagogic procedures, what do we do in the class? Methodological principles are universal. So they're always true no matter what the context of language learning is. The pedagogic procedures are not universal. They're particular to the classroom situation. So this is why it's up to you to figure out how to do TBLT in, in your classroom. What is going to work with your particular students? So I'll give you an example from the diplomatic security. Um, I told you that I observed the experienced DS agent who in fact, he's sitting in the room and he knows who he is. Um, <clears throat> he was the museum security officer and there was a very experienced CS agent came to do his job securing the perimeter. All along the way, the native speaking security guard was providing recasts on errors. I think you know what a recast is. He just said something again saying, making the correction, but not saying anything about it. And usually the student noticed that. It doesn't interrupt the uh, activity, but the student will repeat it. And um, after a couple of times, not, it doesn't always work instantly. He was very skillful at that. Um, and then afterwards, at the very end, he, he said, OK, you did a great job. You do that task really well. You performed the task. You succeeded. Now my job is to make your Spanish per perfect. And he gave him some more feedback on error in about two minutes. And um, that was it. So that's an example of very local pedagogy based on that situation. <clears throat> OK, so here we go to um, student assessment. <laughs> so we, didn't we have some questions, Karen? And then I have two here. Um, so question eight is, so in, in TBLT, you simply ask, can learners perform target tasks to criterion? So I got the question. Um, in traditional language learning models, the assessment is paired according to the learning objective. How do we assess learning in TBLT, given that there are no objectives, just learning the task? So yeah, that is the objective, to learn the task. Um, would it be a situation where fulfilling the task is an assessment in itself? So that is yes. The answer is yes for um, purists. And so for that, you would need to have a rubric. What does it mean to, to, to succeed at the task? So if you have to obtain something, that's easy. Either you got it or you didn't. Like you, when I went to Spain, I made myself go out and get a cell phone and a modem. And the first time I tried to get a cell phone, I didn't succeed because I didn't have enough language to be able to do it. So I went and I started trying. I, made my own pedagogic tasks. Finally, I came out of there with a cell phone. Uh, and so that's how you can do it. Um, 
uh, someone back at Castle, where I was before here, developed some task-based Chinese materials that were online. And she did things like, she, uh, well, she didn't because she wasn't a Chinese speaker, but her colleague called and rented a car <coughs> in Chinese. And then the, when the students did it, they checked to see that the students did all of the same steps in renting a car. So you can have a rubric. Nothing about language. Now, other people have suggested maybe you could add an accuracy of language component to that. TBLT purists would say you don't need that because it's criterion reference. You don't need the language part. There's no reason why you can't add it on if you want to know how accurate the students are. <coughs> so my other question nine was, how is performance on tasks measured? Is it through accuracy? No. On how fluent a student sounds? No. About getting the task accomplished? Yes. <laughs> um, but I think you can see, and if you came to the talk on um, task-based language assessment, it's very complex. It's a whole field in itself. Uh, and I think that um, Cohn Van Korp had a lot of good ideas. It'd be really worth watching the video again. Um, what I would like to say here, and I, another question. There were a, yeah. a few, actually. Go yeah. figures. Um, so does utilizing task-based learning suggest we also need task-based testing? Did you, were you? OK, so um, we all know that we have a very high stakes test which is not a task-based test. Um, so I just want to say two things about that. One is that I'm thoroughly convinced that everything that anyone does in a task-based module helps them for their um, proficiency tests. And I faced this situation when I was at the University of Hawaii. We developed a task-based Korean program for students who had to get a 333. The third skill was in um, well, they split up listening and speaking and then reading. And um, the students were from a very, very traditional way of learning Korean. They were very taken aback when we put them into task-based language teaching. Um, and they said, you know, all we have to do is get 333. Three, three. How are we going to know that we're going to get our 333? Three, three, three? So you have to take this seriously. So we said, we will show you that you're working toward your 333 three, three, with portfolio assessment. And that's what we did. So we showed them what they can do. We talked to them about how they were getting toward their threes. But they were doing task-based language assessment. If we do some task-based language teaching here, we could do form formative assessment. The proficiency test is summative. It's the end of training test. We can do formative assessment along the way to see how well are they doing at the tasks. So I think that we can blend it in easily. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, one of the objectives for the DS VIP module was to evaluate and discuss risks. Doesn't evaluate cross the line into teaching to do the job instead of teaching the language needed? We are not subject matter experts. Oh, good point. So um, the people who are evaluating the risks are the subject matter experts. So I would say don't do it with people who haven't done the job before. And I've talked with a lot of my colleagues, tradecraft mentors in the Romance Languages Division, and they say, oh, we really have to water down the tasks. We just can't do it. They can't do it very well. And so then it's just not going to work, because they don't have the expertise, or it's not built into the module. So that's really true. We're not the subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. So it's only, that's only going to be a good thing if the student is already experienced at the job. This one might be something to answer later on, but I'll leave that for you to decide. Isn't TBLT an offshoot of CLT? If yes, how is grammar instruction incorporated into the curriculum? TBLT being communicative language teaching, I'm assuming. Um, it, so it's that pendulum swing. So the research showed a long time ago, if you're just doing grammar-focused learning, you can't speak the language. I'm just putting this in very rough terms to save time, but that's what the research showed. Focus on grammar rules, grammar paradigms. You can't, you know a lot about the language. You can't speak it or use it. So then they went, especially in Canadian immersion, they said, OK, immersion, content-based language teaching. Let's just focus on communicative functions, speaking, and let's not teach grammar. So what happened in the Canadian research was after um, a whole uh, students experience, and they have really good immersions programs for francophones and anglophones learning the other language, all the way in different models 
from kindergarten through university. When they got to the university, the researchers showed, yes, they're much better than their counterparts who only had French three times a week in high school. However, listen to all the errors they're making. <laughs> and listen to this, the restricted discourse that they're using because they only have the classroom register. So there were problems with that model. So TBLT is in between. And it's, that's why it does have language focus. It's a reactive language focus. So four strands says 25% language focus. TBLT doesn't say anything about the amount of time. It says when. So it should be reactive at the time when it's needed. Great. Could you give some examples of target tasks typical of advanced proficiency levels? Can a political debate or a philosophy discussion be broken down into target tasks? Okay, we'll save that one for the end. That's a very okay. difficult question. Um, is it possible to, be, to use TBLT and FSI beyond just lab simulations? Could TBLT be used in the classroom? If so, could we receive the training to actually know how to use it? <laughs> um, yeah, I think in theory, yes, to all of those things. It would take effort and work. Yeah. Right. It, it is possible. The quest, it's possible. The question that we need to ask, and we'll raise a couple of those questions, and is it feasible? That's what we need to figure out together. If one of the principles is to individualize instruction, shouldn't we keep our classes as small as possible and our contractors on board to make the transition? <laughs> <laughs> you never get away from that question. <laughs> I don't think TBLT necessarily says you have to have small classes, um, but it does see that as an advantage. If you can put people together who are in the same job, so that and that's the key thing. So yes, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <clears throat> the, the task in process is a very important step in TBLT because it is there that the actual learning takes place. The, the what process? I missed that. Um, I may be misreading this, so I apologize. The task in process. Can you spell it? Task hyphen in hyphen process. Um, in process. So yeah. let's see. Um, I, I'm going to read through the entire okay. thing, and then we'll see. Uh, so it's a very important step in TBLT because it is there that the actual learning is taking place. Do it, learning by doing, maybe it means that. Mm, yeah. Transition from one task to another and raising the complexity of the task is equally important to, to reach the pedagogical objectives. Since TBLT does not allow improvisation, how can we manage the tasks according to the student's responses during the lesson? Okay, so maybe I misunderstood in the earlier question what improvisation means. Um, I thought it meant just going and teaching without planning. Um, but it doesn't mean don't let things unfold as they would naturally. So yeah, so I'll, I'll just correct myself on that. Yes, you have to let the task unfold depending on the learners. So the very beginning learners, it's going to be a good idea to make it more structured and guide them according to the complexity till they get to the target task. But keep in mind that the objective, a couple of times I heard in questions, there's no objective. But that isn't true. The objective is to be able to do the target task. So that's one of the you know, mindset shifts. If the mindset shift is there's a language objective, <laughs> you have to shift to there's a task objective. OK, so maybe this is just the last few slides. What can we do next? Um, so I think what I s saw when I was doing these deep dives in, um, in the Spanish simulation professional seminars is that we're doing a really great job in the needs analysis, understanding the tasks. Um, we, we, it would be good to document more, set, establish a um, repository, as I mentioned earlier. I think we should use the um, SLS needs analysis data to do gap analyses, and some of us have done this. Um, I, at the very end, I'm going to show you the tool that um, Ben and his shop have put together so you can see what we have. And people have just said, OK, these are the tasks that our students have to do, and you can sort according to um, career tracks. Are we addressing these tasks in our tradecraft curricula? or any curricula, because people, people are blending the tradecraft more into the basic courses. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it would be great to collect some target language samples at post and compare to our materials, since we have this interesting method of starting with English 
real discourse from English or intuited discourse from English and then rendering it into the language. I have a feeling that that's going to be very efficient for us and I would just like to see if it's generating real language or it's going to be like the Starbucks people never say coffee. Um, <coughs> I doubt that it's going to be like the Starbucks people never say coffee. Um, and then we've heard from the past and from now is that we always have to update our task-based materials and luckily we have students who keep coming back and they say, oh, you know, the regulation changed, we don't do it that way anymore. And we can change the materials. So again, we're really lucky to have the subject matter domain experts right here to work with us. Um, so I think we should, you know, concretely maybe expand projects that have a good start. As I just mentioned, check the rendered language. Launch new projects. So one thing that came up in our um, program reviews, and I attended many program reviews from different divisions, is that our students are asking for what we could call life skills, survival skills, social skills, daily skills. Um, that would be starting from the ground up. Let's try a TB. We're going to try it in, um, in Romance languages across our languages. Let's just start and follow, see if we can follow all the steps. And we started collecting some real target discourse. It's easier in, the, in that context than it is in the professional context to collect the target discourse. We could develop uh, assessments of the modules, formative assessments. So we can have assessment. We don't have to wait until the proficiency test. And then uh, ultimately, we'll ask Ben to help us evaluate the effectiveness of our modules. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna, if we want to do this, we're going to have to change our mindset. We have a great start with the four strands. So I'm really, really happy with the four strands. Um, the, it reiterates the great principles of SLA that I said we should not break. Don't break those rules. Um, it's really helpful. Um, and so, but we're still, some of us working on, what, how do you plan your lesson? Do you plan your lesson because your students said that they need to be able to talk in the future more? That's different from what TBLT is asking, okay? The using the future tense should fall out of doing a task that they need to do at the job. So we can ask them, you know, why are you saying that? <laughs> and then get them to talk about the job task. <coughs> um, I'd love to form a working group to promote and oversee. Um, all of his activities, and Jim has kindly said, go forth and do it. <laughs> so it would be great if we could all work together and um, just keep the momentum going. I think that's it. Oh, yeah, takeaway messages. Um, and then also I'm going to ask you, before we go to those, um, in fact, let's not distract you. I wanted to remind you of the things. I just printed out the slides so I don't have to go back to it. Mindset change. Course content, content is discerned by learner needs and interests, not by an externally imposed grammar syllabus. This is the hardest thing for many people because of past experience. Language focus is reactive and responsive to the learner's internal <coughs> syllabus. That is not so hard for teachers to get used to. And then students learn what they can process. Teach, teaching should keep this in mind. So that's, I think, those are the, the mind shift things that we need to think about. And so then, last thing, takeaway messages. Our context, I believe, is ideal. I gave you some reasons why. Um, we've already implemented some elements. We're not starting from zero. And I really think it's worthwhile going to all the effort that I think you can see it's, it will be. And that's it. Thank you. Do you have more questions? <laughs> <laughs>